Welcome everybody to our uh, Impact of BIM and Technology and Project Risk Management kickoff webinar. We're just going to give it a few more minutes and then we will start. Hi everybody, welcome to the kickoff the webinar for the impact of BIM and technology on project risk management. We are absolutely thrilled to host you today um, and we have got a jam-packed agenda. Speaking of the agenda, let's quickly have a look at what we're going to be covering. So we're going to do a brief welcome and then we're going to introduce this concept of uh, BIM risk management and what our intentions are. And then we are privileged to have Henning Rasmus with us today, who's going to give us an industry perspective. We will then look at the impact of BIM on com common project risks uh, and really focusing on design, cost and schedule. And then we have Kesha Minodius from Anderson, who will look at the legal introduction um, to the considerations when it comes to uh, BIM and technology. And then we will close out with questions. So, uh, Baker Baines uh, has been doing a number of series on BIM and we just really felt uh, it is time that we uh, bring this down to ground level, to, to project level. Um, and the reason for this is because we are passionate about solving our customers' problems through digital transformation and helping them design and make a better world. So for those of you who um, haven't yet engaged with Baker Baines, and this is your first time, uh, for the past seven years, we turned seven this year, um, quite a milestone for us. It's not just about being an Autodesk reseller. For us, we are passionate about uh, consulting with our clients to solve their problems through digital transformation. Um, and in doing so, we offer uh, an array of 
business process improvement consulting services from survey and design hardware and consulting uh, to design software and um, topped off with a blended approach to how we believe that uh, our customers can or should digest information and that's really what BIM is all about. So some of the, the brands that we have aligned ourselves with is obviously Autodesk. We are the largest gold um, Autodesk partner in the country. And uh, for those of you who don't know, we are very proud to say that we are a BE level one contributor. Um, we also work with Leica, which offers scan to BIM services um, or, or hardware. And that's when we're talking about point clouds and uh, scanning as builds. And then we also work with uh, some other amazing brands, including IDAS, uh, which focuses on analytical uh, software applications within the civil space, Cool Orange, which is an incredible data management platform, and then Clear Edge, which is aligned to um, point cloud solutions. Uh, our classroom and virtual training obviously includes Autodesk uh, being an author, authorized training center. And then we have a very unique online learner management system called CAD Learning. Um, I'm going to be sharing a little bit more a little later. So remember that brand because you could very well be the lucky winner of a CAD Learning license a little later. So. Let's talk about this risk management series. There are so many dynamics that our clients face. And when it comes to moving their projects through the different building project phases, um, over the past seven years, Baker Baines has really journeyed with a lot of our clients and witnessed firsthand the myriad of considerations that you have to deal with. So whether it's dealing with clients to design briefs, technology, contractors, collaboration partners, subcontractors, legal contracts, IP, and even the weather, we have seen the maze of risks that you guys have to navigate through. And often concurrently with multiple projects at varying sta stages of progression. So what we've done is we've documented, we've researched, discussed, deliberated, and tested how women technology can help impact project risk management. And it is with much excitement that today, together with our STEAM panel, we kick off this series. It's going to be a six part series that will run over the remainder of this year. And uh, without further ado, let's get started. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yes, there is bad news. So according to the Construction, Construction Industry Institute, there are about 107 construction risks that you should consider when working on a project. Some of these aren't quite actionable, things you can't control, such as force majeure or acts of God. And unfortunately, this is the ugly truth. However, there is good news. So through software, owners and project managers can mitigate the cycle of delay and rework and provide a high level of project visibility to stakeholders by allowing for timely access to data, documents and reports, enhanced transparency and a higher quality of work and integrity. So while risks are complex, the risk response techniques fall into four main categories. The first is you should avoid the risk. This is obviously the, the ideal situation. So if you feel you unequipped to handle a major risk or do not have the right uh, risk plan in place, the safe option is to steer clear of the project or change the scope. So for example, if you want to avoid building projects in um, something that you're not familiar with, for example, factories or commercial high rise, if you mostly do commercial work, then avoid it completely. That is not always possible, as we know. So the next option is to transfer the risk. So while this is costly, this solution may ultimately be less costly than accepting the risk itself. So let's look at an example where you could transfer the risk by appointing another party to do the coordination or stage four and five. Thirdly is you can look at mitigating the risk. So this is where you create plans to keep the risk as low as possible, 
you can train staff and equip them with the tools and the processes to help. And then lastly is just to accept the risk. And there are times where you just need to accept this in order to complete the projects. Then in addition to your risk management plans, you can also rely on different resources to address these complexities. Construction companies use the following resources in their risk management plans. The first being software. The right cloud-based construction management software can help you manage the process tasks quicker, including building design, costs, safety, compliance, and accounting. These functions help you to mitigate risk as you handle an increasing number of projects. And obviously, Autodesk has a really great solution for that. Secondly is professional advice. Legal firms that specialize in construction contracts as well as BIM consultants are good sources of advice for professionals for business. And then lastly is technology. So the use of new essential innovations such as drones, scanners, BIM, and prefabricated building methods can help mitigate or elim eliminate common risks such as poor time management, safety hazards, and weather. So this series overview is going to cover some of these topics, including reality capture and as built collaboration and coordination, legal and contracting, common data environments and construction management, information requirements, and asset management. And we are going to package this content in a series of webinars, six to be exact, this being the first, and then we will also be publishing um, a series of ebooks which will contain the golden nuggets from each one of these webinars. So that's enough from me. I, I, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to some of our esteemed uh, speakers today. The first being Henning Rasmus. So Henning uh, is an architect who lives in South Africa but has a completed project experience in over 19 countries, uh, both in Africa and Brazil. Um, and he's knowledgeable and enthusiastic about fast developing African capital cities. He spent the last six years of his working life um, on the African continent. And um, he has worked more as a development manager than an architect, bringing together the various parts of projects and facilitating connections between people and opportunities and skills. His personal interests nurture his work as he has a keen eye for com contemporary urban culture, a fascination with history, power relations, and a hunger for being outside of his comfort zone. Uh, he is really incredible being uh, agile, uh, working with optimistic teams for projects in difficult business environments. And even though he's a generalist by nature, he's really inclusive in his approach. He has completed project types, including uh, corporate head offices, corporate interior design, strategic space planning, shopping centers, mixed use developments, medium and high rise apartments, master planning, gated communities, student houses, hotels and resorts, industrial parks, data centers, sports stadiums, and social sports development projects, just to name a few. And um, so we, we really are privileged to have Henning with us today, and we're gonna hand back to him shortly, but let me also introduce Niran Ibrahim, who is our resident structural engineer at Baker Banks, we really pride ourselves that uh, we have professionals who train our clients. Um, she has an MSc in structural engineering. Uh, she has expertise in Revit modeling and BIM 360, as well as the Autodesk Construction Cloud. Um, her design experience largely stems around multi-story residential, industrial, and educational buildings. And she is an expert specifically in the steel side of structural engineering. And then we've got an in uh, Nauta, Nauta, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correct, 
Uh, she is our resident architect and BIM specialist in the built environment. Um, she has experience both in design and project execution um, in commercial, corporate, industrial, hospitality and residential projects. And then lastly, um, but definitely not least, I'd, I'd like to introduce Kesha Manolius. Uh, she is a director at Anderson um, and she specializes in the litigation department. So Kesha, um, specializing in litigation uh, in high level, in a high level of uh, commercial litigation, um, alternative dispute resolution and business restructuring and insolvency. She has over 12 years of experience in the legal fraternity and provides both commercial and litigation assistance for local and international clients. She enjoys immersing herself in clients, businesses and understanding the industry, pressure points and goals so that she can be a true partner in their growth and success. With extensive experience in dispensing legal advice, advice in the oil and the gas industry, she also has assisted clients in various under, other industries, including mining, construction, renewable energy, insurance, logistics, software development, interior design, as well as manufacturing and trade. Kesha was admitted as an attorney in February 2013 and was appointed to the position of senior associates in 2015 and in 2018 she joined Anderson in South Africa as a director. So as you can see we really do have a, a well-versed panel today who are going to be sharing um, their insight in terms of the impact of BIM and technology on project risk management. But without further ado, I'd like to now hand over to Henning Rasmus, who's going to give us an industry perspective. So, welcome Henning. Thank you Amanda and thank you to Baker Baines for the introduction and the invite. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk to the industry. I'm the original guy who graduated in 1994 and thought it wasn't necessary to learn AutoCAD because we were convinced that drawing boards were so good and we were so fast on them that this kind of stuff would never take over. So um, I'm busy forming new a new business at the moment with a new approach to technology, particularly in the BIM space, particularly in relation to data centers. As a business, of course, the companies that I've been with, the Paragon Group, have been good adopters and probably some of the earlier large adopters of Revit. But talking of Revit and BIM, let's start there. I think from an industry perspective, there is still massive confusion about what is BIM and what's Revit, and the two are often equated in clients' minds, in consultants' minds, in discussions, in project discussions. Um, we as a company or group of companies have started adopting Revit since 2005 and since 2012 have been running absolutely documentation on all our projects, architecture and interiors in, uh, in Revit. BIM is another animal, BIM is often misunderstood, BIM is brought to us from the outside. Going back to Revit, how did our clients in, let's say, Johannesburg, large corporate work, adopt? How did, how did they get there? How did the large architectural practices around the country get to have support for the adoption just of Revit? In our experience, it was driven by clients. Clients understood the advantages some consultants were ready and clients started enforcing the use of certain levels of integration of software. So the industry story in South Africa certainly started with consultants who were ready a, a, an industry that then was quite stable and large with the ability to invest and um, universities starting to seed the knowledge of various 3D CAD systems, but um, including Autodesk Revit, obviously, into the universities. Um, BIM is a different um, journey altogether because it comes later, it comes from the outside. Clients separate into, in our experience, global corporates who bring this with them. Uh, BIM specifications that get written into tenders when there aren't systems of adoption on the ground and teams that don't necessarily pull in the same direction. 
our experience at the moment in South Africa is that um, the the ability for team wide adoption, the, the ability is there, but maybe not the push. Um, there is resistance from certain clients, and quite frankly, a shortage of people because clients, certain client organisations, suddenly have to have people with technical insight that they don't otherwise need. So there's a competition for resources, a competition for people. Everybody is looking for BIM managers, but the question, who is a BIM manager? Is it an architectural technologist who is tired of drawing? Is it an architect who kind of uh, wants to change career? Is it a project manager who's more looking at it from the planning side? So it's uh, not an easy period of adoption that we're in. That's talking from a South African perspective. But we do run large projects. There are um, advisors and also project managers who drive these, um, uh, let's say, technology adoptions at project level. There is an easy way to build consensus. There's an easy way to bring people on board. And we have completed major projects with full BIM adoption. 144 Oxford Road for Growth Point, which is now Anglo-American's head office. Um, the AXA head office at our Tambo Airport are just some of the uh, buildings in our companies in South Africa. And um, <clears throat> in that way, um, certainly South Africa, South Africa is in many ways a world leader in, a, in the adoption of technology, from the financial sector to construction. Um, you know, qualified architects, qualified engineers are being recruited away right now by other building economies that need South African skills. So certainly South Africa is an enabling environment. Um, in my personal career, in my companies, I've worked for many years outside of the country and across the continent. The um, realities are quite different. Um, the continent divides into, let's say, broad zones of east, west, central, north, south, and levels of trust are very different in different parts of the continent. In my experience in East Africa, levels of trust in the construction and property and design industries generally are unfortunately low. Um, so to come into a low trust environment that exists for, we could probably talk about it for two or three hours over a beer, but low trust environments that exist for whatever reason, to come, let's say, from the outside or as an innovative company or as a reseller to introduce collaboration tools in an environment where people already on a Tuesday morning don't easily collaborate is a hard sell. So in East Africa, in my personal experience, we find it quite hard to find team-wide adoption of BIM. In our own office, we've had interesting learning experiences. We worked on a 23-story high-rise residential tower where really in the professional team, we had two out of seven consultants using Revit, never mind working in a BIM environment and really having our project architect develop his own way of using rich modeling, let me just call it that, information rich modeling, standalone, kind of together with BSG, a fantastic services engineer in Kenya, to build the model up and then simply extract paper based printouts that made the collaboration possible. So we really drove, let's say, our own way of using the models to have outputs that ended up on paper, not as an interactive model to drive better quality discussions. So why am I telling you the story is, um, I think it's important to realize that we, sh that it's easy to make excuses for what you can't do and how BIM can't happen because not everybody's on board. Well, if everybody's not on board, use it for yourself and bring the outputs that you get for yourself back into more conventional processes, more conventional service coordination. We had a fantastic young Kenyan architect, Edwin Seda, in our office who drove this process with a passion as a Kenyan architect into the Kenyan market. And um, so when one can also use one's own initiatives to build islands of excellence in the kind of morass of a project where there isn't team-wide adoption. So I wanted to share that as an encouraging story. It comes at a cost, of course, but it's worth it because once you 
have your own protocols, you can um, you can make yourself stronger. The, the, you have to invest anyway in knowledge. The question is where. Um, going maybe to West Africa, there's uh, stronger economies like Lagos. I mean, a 20 million person city will have strong contractors. We find that in places like Lagos, there are contractors who really lead on the um, BIM adoption side, BIM actually being used on site, actually being used for construction planning, for sequence modeling, for for mocking up construction sequences, quite different from South Africa. So a lot of that knowledge we find comes from London, London trained Nigerian contractor, contracts managers who bring this knowledge back. And there are surprising pushes. I mean, we have contractors on a data center in Lagos who push back our drawings and give us um, kind of pushback about the lack of information or lack of coordination. So the landscape is vastly different. And I think West Africa is quite enabling in terms of levels of trust um, adoption that doesn't just sit in the professional team. And clients who actually maybe don't know and don't care, that doesn't make them bad people. I think in places like Nigeria, there are teams and also in Ghana that work in this way almost around the clients. The clients don't need to know the teams get themselves together. So a very mixed landscape. Personally, I'm getting quite involved in data centers. Um, data centers are interesting because they are incredibly detailed and nuanced levels of BIM model issuing, the issuing of information and the formatting of information. Every operator, every developer has highly specific um, ways of issuing information and scrutinizing information, sometimes too different and too specific. So every client is a particular, particular learning curve that is quite different for our team members. But all of these are journeys worth doing. I think over the next few years, the diversity of uh, formats will flatten out and there will be broader consensus. At the moment, the extremely high levels of BIM reporting and drawing issuing and numbering of formats and coordinations is creating work streams that are probably counterproductive, but they, they work perfectly into the end user organization's imperatives but they, or, or outcomes, but they don't necessarily transfer, they don't necessarily make it easy to transfer those skill sets inside your organization from project to project. But let's say all of these are learning, learning, well, teething problems. Um, BIM adoption is still new and to get back to the beginning of what I was saying, there's a confusion between Revit use and BIM adoption and it's very important that we work together to not conflate the two. Um, that's maybe an initial start. I've kind of got 15 minutes. I'm not sure if Amanda has a question. Two yeah, minutes simple. left. <laughs> okay. Um, in that case, um, yeah, I think, I think Broadly, um, we find, um, I find the adoption of BIM incredibly empowering. I'm rebuilding a company where I'm using it quite differently. We honestly believe that the time is now to fundamentally rethink our production systems. We are starting specifically in the data center space where projects and project components can be properly um, uh, uh, can be enriched by attaching all performance parameters to them so that even at a sketch design level, these highly complex technical buildings can be, um, can be made to be intelligent even in the first concept model. So um, that's the journey I'm on at the moment and I think different building types probably will in different practices go through similar journeys. Um, the, potential of freeing up architects and technologists from what we can quite frankly call the dog work, the scheduling, the boring stuff, the window schedules. Uh, I fully believe that there's a revolution already upon us and in the next five to eight years. The, um, the difficult and grind work part of production will be lifted in part from us. Um, the question is, 
what we are actually going to pay it for, given that, especially in South Africa, we give most of our high-level IP away in the form of risk work in the pursuit of getting paid fees one day for what is the grind work behind it. But that's a discussion for another day. From a risk management perspective, um, certainly we see the advantages of BIM adoption, especially now after COVID, the monitoring of components, the extracting out of components into um, earlier um, early procurement, the focusing on supply line bottlenecks, BIM is being actively used and it is a tool where you can also isolate your elements of a project that are exposed to procurement and logistics risks, container shortages, and actually document your your document and extract documents out of the project um, out of the model that assist in overcoming, for example, log logistics risks. We're seeing that actively being used and it is certainly a strong push for collaboration at the moment is overcoming logistics challenges post-COVID. And I think with that, my time is up. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Henning. Um, as you have heard, Henning has journeyed a long time with uh, BIM and it's good to hear um, how it actually translates in a project context. So thank you so much for that. Now we're gonna hand over to Anin and Niran, and they are going to look at the impact of BIM and common project risks. So let's quickly hand over. Great. Um, good morning, everyone, and thanks for the introduction and sharing your insight and experience with us, Henning. So for um, to start our part of this webinar, um, I'm first going to talk about some common risks that is involved with uh, building projects and also get some in input from you guys regarding your thoughts about risks and the likelihood of, of them occurring. So to do this, I'm going to quickly run a poll with uh, two questions that I will uh, share on the screen. And then I would like for you to select um, the, yeah, the answer for each of these. So just give me a second. Great. Okay, so the question is, uh, select your two most common uh, building project risks. And then, um, yeah, so from the, the five answers, you can select two, select one. <laughs> okay, let's see. Cool. So I'm just waiting for some more responses to, to come in. And it seems like uh, design changes is the most probable one. Interesting. Great. We clip it on the second question. Then um, the second one, which of the these risks that you've just seen have the most severe consequence? Okay. So at the moment, it's design changes and inaccurate quantity takeoffs that is uh, neck and neck, but it seems like inaccurate uh, quantity takeoffs and cost estimation um, is voted as the most severe uh, consequence or risk. Okay, great. It was nice getting some, some feedback from you guys. Just wanna quickly close this. 
Okay. Then, um, so now that I've got some feedback from you guys, um, we've also listed some of our thoughts regarding risks in, in construction projects, and we've categorized them into three buckets, which is also how we're going to go about our discussion. So the first bucket is uh, construction project risks during the design phase. So um, on the screen is a, is a couple of our examples, uh, poor communication, for instance, um, everyone is not on the same page as to what is the required design brief or, or the design intent, and this obviously leads to design errors. Um, design interferences or design clashes, we all know very well. Um, revision issues, for example, um, project team members are not working on the same uh, design revision, and all of these can put your, your project at risk. Then uh, the second bucket is risks uh, in terms of the project schedule or timeline. Now, um, if we once again look at some of the examples, uh, a lack of proper schedule insight uh, before construction uh, leads to inaccurate or unrealistic scheduling. Uh, incomplete or improper design obviously um, has a domino effect on the, the project timeline and also the critical path. Uh, uh, poor change management um, is also one which can obviously um, cause delays. And then the third bucket, uh, which is risks in terms of costs. Um, so in, incomplete design documentation or a lack of proper uh, design information models can lead to inaccurate uh, quantity takeoffs and also cost estimations. Um, with this, you have waste and overspending because of poor and unintelligent designs and also uh, design errors, which causes costly rework. Now, getting also uh, getting back to what Henning has also uh, said earlier, um, with regards to uh, one of the issues that we are seeing with um, with BIM is um, besides the, the the common risks um, with regards to uh, construction projects, is really around BIM adoption um, and the inherent risk it holds for for organisations who who doesn't adopt BIM or are BIM ready. Um, in South Africa, uh, still there is a fairly slow adoption to BIM, and this is, is due to uh, a lack of understanding BIM's capabilities. Um, also, project teams are uh, still using uh, different systems, meaning that its full potential as a risk management tool uh, for the entire project life cycle remains underutilized. And then for some, BIM is just daunting. Um, if we think about the ISO standards for um, information management as an example, um, it all just seems like a complicated process. Okay, and now that we've, we've had a brief look at some of the risks, let's look at how BIM can mitigate some of these risks. So before I jump into the detail, let's just quickly recap on, on what BIM is. So if we look at a definition in terms of ISO 19650, um, it defines BIM as the use of a shared digital representation of a built asset to facilitate design, construction and operation processes uh, to form a reliable basis for decisions. Now, this is a lot of words and a very theoretical um, explanation. So in simpler terms, when looking at what BIM means, I like to break it up into three tiers. So first of all, BIM is a working process. So once again, like Henning said, it's not just a software or a physical item or an object. And this process is applicable to the entire uh, life cycle of a project or a building. Then BIM is all about information. Uh, in other words, it's a means of collating, communicating and managing information on a construction project once again through its entire life cycle. In this uh, information management process, uh, diverse packets of data are brought together uh, in order to enable information exchange between the right people at the right time, which is essentially collaboration. Then it's also about building a virtual asset, which consists of graphical models, asset data, and uh, documentation. And this is also commonly referred to as the information model. So uh, basically BIM is not just a design process, but it's also a process to drive better information management. And that is something that we all who are working or collaborating on our projects um, are looking for. So this brings us to the topic of our discussion, which is that 
BIM has the potential to significantly improve time and cost assurance across the entire life cycle of construction and infrastructure projects, as it provides improved data visibility and management. Okay, so for the next part of our discussion, we're going to look at BIM's ability to mitigate uh, risks, which we're going to break up into the three categories that I've mentioned earlier. And these are design, schedule, and cost. Okay, so starting off with, with design. Now, we've heard that BIM enables the creation of visual models that depict the proposed space and also how it will be used. Um, and because of having this fully integrated 3D information um, model, it drives enhanced uh, project visualization. Um, if you think about computer animations and 3D uh, model fly-throughs, and this um, then allows for design errors uh, to be spotted and correct it in advance, uh, which uh, essentially minimizes rework later on that comes with errors. As you have better visualization, all stakeholders can better uh, comprehend the design intent um, and the building, both from a, um, a performance and an exp experience perspective. This uh, eliminates the risk of non-conformity with the design brief, um, as well as design scope creep. With your, um, your information model, uh, it drives better and more inf uh, informed decision making um, already at an early stage of a project be, uh, because you are better able to visualize the building in 3D. And then an important one is improved coordination and class detection, which is possible once again to spot potential design interferences um, between ser uh, services and minimizes um, issues occurring later on site. Furthermore, um, the information model, i.e. BIM, uh, it enables parametric modeling, which allows for easy updates and design revisions, uh, as well as more accurate design documentation. It also gives you the ability to do high, a high level of model analysis, which leads to more accurate space calculations, a higher level of energy efficiency and structural uh, analysis details. These mitigate the risk of inaccurate or inefficient design documentation once again and designs also not conforming to the required building standards. If we look at BIM in terms of the process and its risk mitigation ability, it would be that BIM enables you, uh, you to have an improved project execution plan. You have data interoperability, which allows for more uh, effective exchange and processing of information. And this leads to better collaboration between stakeholders, improved communication, more efficient workflows, um, specialization, as well as automation. These all lowers the risk of, of data loss, fragmented and complicated workflows, um, costly migrations to coherent platforms, all leading to time being wasted and cost overruns. Then looking at the, the project schedule. Now, once again, starting off with the information model. When uh, intelligently linking a 3D digital model with time or schedule related information, you get 40 BIM. Now, if I talk about intelligently linking, um, it refers to 40 BIM visualization that incorporates start and finish uh, project data that gives a more realistic view of the entire project timeline. This essentially enables more accurate um, project scheduling, which lessens the challenge that is associated with traditional scheduling of, of construction uh, sequences, as well as misunderstandings uh, caused by a lack of visualization. Then 4D BIM also enables the simulation of construction sequence, uh, allowing for better planning and scheduling, uh, because you can connect tasks in the schedule with objects in the model to create these simulations, which then allows you to see the effects of uh, the schedule on the model and compare uh, plan dates against actual dates. Then also with 4D BIM, you can better manage uh, the project schedule um, and perform updates, which mitigates the risk of inaccurate scheduling, scope creep, delays, and unbudgeted variations. All in all, uh, 4D BIM gives you a better perspective of schedule-related risks, which avoids the risk of not having uh, a risk mitigation uh, strategy in place. 
Then uh, BIM as a, as a process and information management tool allow in the sense of, of schedule um, allows for faster workflows, which essentially saves time. Um, you have more effective uh, progress tracking, improved RFI, submittal and change management, the ability to better plan resources to ensure staff, labor and material availability, uh, which affects uh, or can affect the schedule, and then essentially improved sites and construction management in order to avoid delays on site as far as possible. Then the last bucket, which is risks in terms of cost. Now, um, when you link cost data with the 3D model, you get 5D BIM visualization. Um, now, as you have more intelligent and optimized designs uh, with BIM, this in turn allows for waste reduction, um, affecting cost savings. So with your 5D information model, you have better, more accurate quantity takeoffs that can be performed, which mitigates the risk of incorrect measurements and, and cost escalations as well. So um, the process of doing uh, cost in summations uh, is also much quicker and more detailed, uh, which avoids inaccurate costing, uh, scope creep and uh, budget overruns as well. The 5D model also gives you a better perspective of cost-related risk and the, uh, the ability to uh, more accurately plan future expenses. Then um, a 5D BIM process allows um, or also drives a better collaboration. Uh, for example, between the QS, the financial manager and other stakeholders, which uh, eliminates inefficient working processes that can incur time overruns and essentially cost escalation. With better coordination and planning capabilities, as mentioned before, um, you have more timely clash detections that are possible uh, in order to mitigate the risk of unforeseen issues which can cause unbudgeted expenses. And uh, planning of material and resources are more effective, which results in cost savings. Um, with 5D BIM, also, you've got better cost control and tracking um, in order to avoid uh, costly rework. And you also have more effective change management, which is really uh, beneficial to the, the project budget as well. In essence, BIM means higher returns on investment and a lowered risk both for your project and your organization as well. Uh, for example, a study done by McKinsey found that 75% of businesses that use BIM um, report positive re returns on their investment. Uh, the respondents in the study also reported significant savings on material costs and paperwork, as well as shorter project life cycles. So with all of this being said, I'm going to hand over to Neuron to just show us some practical examples of BIM as a risk uh, manage uh, or mitigation tool. Thanks, Anin. Okay. Um, can I maybe just get a confirmation that everybody can see my screen okay? Yes. Cool. Thanks for that, Anin. Um, so with that um, overview of um, the series that we're trying to tackle, I'm going to give um, some insight into um, three or four examples of how you can use um, uh, portions of a BIM workflow to reduce some of these risks. Um, as Amanda mentioned, this is a series, so we will go into detail um, uh, through each of those buckets that Anin mentioned. Um, this is just um, highlighting a few uh, and certainly some of the most common ones that we've seen from some of our clients. So um, I'm going to run through this in sort of four sections, gathering information, finding information, um, using information and coordinating information. As both Anina and Hidden uh, alluded to, when we talk about 
the BIM process, we're talking about the um, process of managing information. Um, and so we want to have a look at the different tools that we can use to streamline this process and manage the risks that we um, uh, face during each of these periods uh, during the project life cycle. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is uh, when you're working on a renovation or alteration project, there's always an exercise um, we're measuring up of an existing building needs to take place. And um, if, you've, if you've been through this, you know that you, the day is set, I'm setting out the site now to go measure up on this building. You've got all your gadgets and your tools, tools and gadgets being pen and paper. Um, you might be a little bit fancy with the laser, um, a laser scanner, a, like the handheld one, um, and so on, and you and you set off for the day to go and do your measuring. Um, so the process, um, you know, uh, follows um, uh, typical steps whereby you gather the blueprints, if there are any, um, you try and uh, trace the existing information that you have and clean it up, um, and then whatever additional information that you need, you will go out to site, measure up, mark this up and so on. Um, if you're lucky, if not, you're starting right from scratch. Um, and to be able to get all the existing services and, and things that are actually running um, through, the re through the roof or, or wherever that may be, it takes a little bit of eyeball sometimes. Um, and then after the long day on site, you're back in the office for another couple of long days of drafting these changes. So this is something that um, is, um, I think if you've been through it, you, you, you know that it can become quite painful. Uh, it's, it's, it's extremely manual. And um, the risk that will be involved there is that you can end up with a lot of um, inaccurate um, inaccurate processes that results in those costly change orders. Um, so you don't have the accurate and reliable information um, that you're looking for. And this not only gives a little bit of doubt here and there, but might cost you another trip to site. And um, then you're moving into schedule and cost overruns as well. Um, of course, using uh, this kind of um, laser scanner is, um, is a lot better than using the good old tape measure and having to take one of your colleagues with you. Um, but it is still limited in terms of um, how much more efficiency you can get when you start to use BIM enabled workflows for this portion of gathering information on existing or alteration projects. Um, this is quite typical of what you would come back with from site after you've done your measuring up. And um, this is if you're lucky that your page didn't blow away in the wind or become crumpled up or dirtied with uh, cement or uh, fallen on the ground or anything like that, you'll, you'll be able to come home with something like this. Um, so to avoid um, the, ris the risks that are inherent with this kind of manual process, um, uh, what, we will, what I want to present is a scan to BIM workflow um, that is quite beneficial when it comes to reducing the time spent on gathering this um, existing information. This is something that we see is becoming a lot more popular with our clients. Um, it really can reduce the amount of time you spend on gathering existing information um, to a fraction of the time. And of course, the information is always at your fingertips um, when you're needing to proceed through the design uh, process. So let's just have a look at what it looks like. This is a typical, um, this is a typical existing building, perhaps. Um, normally, you would go out with um, some uh, form of scanning or maybe with a colleague. This can become quite tedious, and this is where um, your schedule overruns um, might come in. But I think the inaccurate data um, is, is is, is the big one. Um, so a process, a scan to BIM process has three steps. Um, first one would be capturing, so going out with the laser tool. There are various types of um, scanners that are available, not only drones, um, but in effect you will come out with um, a point cloud data. This is um, one of the products that we, we use. Once the scanning is complete, you then move over to the computing process um, where this information is analyzed. So you've got your scan data that you can go and import into your design software, this one being Revit. And uh, this is where you start the design creation phase. Um, you Once you've imported that data model, um, you can then start with your design and match that up to uh, what is actually existing. So there's a bunch of different ways that you can go about this, different tools, uh, depending on the nature of the project, but ultimately you want to design and build with the confidence that you can get um, from this kind of workflow. Um, so um, another, um, there are also sort of other tools besides 
um, uh, rivet that also can be used for, for visualization of the point cloud relative to existing data. But what you're seeing on the screen, for example, um, this is a, a combination of um, a representation of the ASPL presented by a point, cl point cloud that was taken, um, gathered using a, a, a type of laser scanner. And then what's really nice is that you can actually go and compare this with the original design intent once you have this information in a 3D model. Um, so this might be a little bit of shifting due to um, aging of the pipe or so on, or this could be direct, this can be done directly after construction where you can see um, if there were any um, um, inaccurate placements and so on. And so these, there's a lot of valuable um, insights that can come from a workflow like this. Um, you know, of course, you can use it in different ways depending on the nature of your project. And then also the, um, the, there are various tools that can support this uh, point cloud data, um, not only Revit, but Civil 3D as well, even AutoCAD, um, if you're still in the 2D environment, and then Plant 3D, which is quite useful um, for pipes and services and mechanical equipment and so on. And then um, in addition, there are also other pieces of software um, by Clear Edge using Verity and Rhythm, where um, some of these design processes can actually be automated um, uh, using the point cloud data. And um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of benefits that can be derived, and we will have through our series, we will focus um, on the scan to boom workflow in a bit more detail. Um, this is just a nice overview, um, and I'm sure that you can already imagine the benefits. Something else um, is finding information and um, information referring to, uh, you know, when you're doing your day-to-day -day tasks, you're at your desk, you're doing your design, whether it be architectural design, mechanical design, structural design, um, or even drafting or so on, um, you know, you're always needing to find various bits of information to bring it together, whether this information be on a PDF, an Excel sheet, um, your design software, Revit, AutoCAD, but you ultimately are working with um, a bunch of different programs, right? So your task form might look something like this. You've got a whole lot of um, applications running at one time. Your folder structure might look something like this. It seems like something quite small, but having a nice organized folder structure, um, not only on your local drive, but even your company server, um, so that you can find information um, uh, quite easily. Everybody in the team knows where to find the, the right information. That's something that is valuable as well when it comes to that risk management. And then you've also got multiple browsers open and not to mention the emails that are constantly popping through. So this is something that you might experience every day uh, without realizing that um, on average, um, the average um, knowledge employee, they say, spends about 2.5 hours a day just looking for information. That looking for information involves opening up a folder, navigating here and there, asking someone, where's this, going to your email, searching for the document, you're not sure what the latest is. And um, I think people don't realize actually how much time this takes up. This is about 30% uh, of your day just looking for information. And so when you come to that, uh, that overruns in terms of uh, time, which if essentially affects into cost that Anin was talking about. Um, just looking for information is one of those risks that you face when you don't have a structured um, uh, data environment of where to find your information. And so when we talk about mitigating this risk, um, we are looking at ways in which you can improve your information management as well. Uh, so um, Autodesk also has got some tools available for this. And this is relating to that common data environment. And um, once again, we will go through this in a little bit more detail, but what you're essentially wanting to do is centralize your common data environment so that everybody, all the stakeholders on the project knows exactly where to find the latest information. So that common data environment is your one single source of truth, um, not multiple um, uh, places to look for that information. Um, what's really nice about this particular tool, um, the Autodesk Construction Cloud, is that it has very good um, document version control. So that means that whenever you access this location, you will always be looking at the latest and greatest, um, and that is highly valuable, um, especially for, for the QSs, I know. Um, of course, data security is important. There's um, nice tools in there in terms of permissions control. So everything that you upload is not just available to 
everyone, but you can actually go and set permissions for your team members um, for to make sure that you the right information is in the right hands. And um, there are some other tools also that improve um, uh, workflows in terms of uh, approval processes, which once again we will go through in detail. And then it provides a nice um, record keeping. Um, system and you can do a lot of um, reporting from there as well and quite importantly is that transparency um, so that you know who did what and when and so on. Um, so just looking at what risks this actually that helps to mitigate um, is uh, data discrepancies in terms of uh, making sure you're always working on the latest um, so that outdated information um, and document version uh, an outdated document versioning is not a risk. Um, data breach, wrong information in the wrong hands. Um, you are also limiting that wasted time and wasted money that you are spending just looking for the latest thing. Um, and then, of course, bottlenecks in communication we know can also become um, quite the consequences of that can become uh, can add up on a project and ineffective reporting as well. So now that you are moving beyond the design stage, initial prelim design stage of your project and moving on to the coordinating part, um, which we know sometimes is a big bottleneck for a lot of, for a lot of our customers, um, ineffective, uh, coordinate, ineffective coordinating of, um, of services and so on. Um, so when we're talking about coordination, um, these various different ways that coordination can take place. Um, so, I mean, the good old light box, um, that's the job, but um, with design changes happening so frequently, um, you know, this can be, become quite time consuming and also not as um, effective with the way that the design process has changed over the years. Um, so obviously we've moved on from there, uh, we've moved on to 2D environments like AutoCAD and your coordination is a little bit um, uh, more uh, easier and also uh, visually um, uh, easier to present as well um, in this in this kind of environment, but within the BIM sort of spectrum, um, we can take it up even um, another notch, and that is to the 3D environment. And once again, um, there are lots of tools out there, um, tools and softwares out there that enables different kinds of coordination, uh, whether it be with Navisworks or um, even within Revit itself, and then also on the Autodesk Construction Cloud. Um, it's got a nice uh, set of coordination tools that helps you to actually coordinate in the cloud, which of course has got some additional benefits um, uh, to that. And um, so just to give you a little bit of a demonstration of what this looks like on the actual platform, um, here we can see a, um, models that have been um, uploaded into one space. And what's really nice about this tool is that it allows you to select um, um, two or three or four models and overlay them with one another. So this is your Revit models from your other, from your consultants. You're overlaying them over here. We can see that there's a clash with a duct and a pipe. Um, and what's really nice is directly within this tool, we can go and highlight where this clash has occurred, mark this as an issue, and then go and give some um, details to, to what this is. So. Here we are also um, giving an instruction on how to resolve this right there and then. Um, and what's really nice within this tool, you can actually go and tag people, assign a due date so that this person that is responsible for this um, knows when this needs to be completed by. And there's um, some additional information that can be attached as well. So it's nice and visual and it also serves as a, a log um, so that uh, the responsible person can go and address that one by one. So now um, with all of these tools that we are using, um, another sort of benefit that uh, shouldn't be overlooked is the, uh, the ability to actually generate useful information and use it um, at different stages of the project. And so talking about using um, information, what I also wanted to just touch on was um, um, the underutilized BIM tools that, um, that Anin mentioned to, uh, in her previous segment. And um, when you start becoming comfortable with the different BIM workflows and the tools, um, automation is one of those things that you can also use to mitigate some of the risks um, that are involved with those mundane tasks um, that, you know, 
you really wish you didn't have to do or spend so much time on every day so that you can get to the to the to the more complicated stuff um, and so with automation um, um, that opportunity is there um, not only in terms of time but also to reduce any human error that can occur with those kinds of tasks um, and therefore that um, risk in reducing um, time spent and making errors um, is also addressed with automation. Um, what's really nice is that there's a good relationship between um, Revit and Dynamo and there's a lot of advantages that can be taken in this regard. Um, something that we are working on is a package um, that actually um, automates some of the, the those redundant tasks that every drafter spends probably at least an hour or two on a day. So um, reducing those 15 minute tasks to something like three seconds or so, um, it just helps to save time and improve on that e efficiency um, so that you are not spending as much time on those projects. Um, so if we're looking at uh, something like documentation, which is inevitable, all engineers and um, um, drafters and designers need to produce some form of documentation, some form of drawing. Um, and so automating um, those typical things that we do, like creating levels, um, adding dimensions to your grid lines, um, parking renumbering, which we'll have a look at now, um, numbering some of the ele other elements on your drawings, creating um, plan sheets, adding legends and notes. Those are all things that you do over and over and over following the same steps and um, taking full advantage of tools that allow you to automate these processes really um, will just enhance um, just enhance your workflows and reduce the time spent on that. Um, so yeah, the, what I was talking about, the, what we are producing is, uh, we call it our, it's part of our transformation tools uh, package. And um, we actually have a website that just launched with a bunch of different other transformation tools. Um, and so this package for documentation will be coming soon. So you can keep an eye out for that. There certainly will be um, another webinar or something of the sort uh, closer to the time. But let's have a look at what something like this actually looks like looks like. So um, if you've worked on a residential building um, where there is a uh, parking lot or even a commercial commercial building, um, you know that parking uh, configurations change at least at least two or three times on any project. That may be because of um, because of um, legislation maybe or um, uh, changes by the client, design changes, whatever the case may be, um, your parking will need to be reconfigured and they also need to be numbered. So having to go and number each parking bay or renumber them one by one, um, that is something that can take some time. So this is an example of a script that is available that helps you to automate this. So let's have a look and see what this looks like. So here you see we've got a parking uh, configuration. Um, the numbers are blank because they haven't been added yet. Um, and so this workflow um, will um, require you to draw what's called a model line through the cross section of your base. Um, and this is just um, to set up the actual, um, the actual model so that the script can work okay. All right. So you've got your model lines in place. Next thing you're going to have to do is open up Dynamo. Dynamo is, um, um, at, well, it used to be an add-in. It's now available with Revit um, as, a, as a stand. Um, yeah. And um, OK, so what we're doing now is entering the number at which you want to start numbering one. And now um, to select that model line to indicate which are the bays that you want to number, we'll have to come back to the model, select that line. Um, so that all the all the parking bays that run through the model line will be numbered and simply hit run. Okay, with that um, complete, you can see that the numbers have been populated in the tags. And um, now we'll just do the next one. So the previous um, set ended at 11. That means the next set of bays will start at 12. Come back, select that line, hit run. And it has now been populated starting at the number 12 all the way to number 15. And when this uh, parking base reconfigure, you simply rerun the script and it will place the numbers um, sequentially. So this is just one of the examples. This is something that can take a couple of minutes. Once you hit run, that's a three second process. So those were um, four examples. As I said, as we go through the series, we will run through different examples and also using your input as well um, as to what you would like to see um, different portions of your workflow how you know you're welcome to to ask us you know how how can the BIM tools um, uh, reduce the risk of 
a particular portion of your workflow and so on. Um, but all in all, just to, to, to sort of summarize what, what we, we've talked about so far is that these BIM applications in your building and your construction project um, enables a couple of things. Um, effective uh, project visualization, of course, is one of the big ones, just because it's in a 3D environment, you can see everything um, um, aggregated in one when you do coordination. So that is a very big plus. Um, that, of course, leads into better collaboration and communication as well. When you're starting to look at centralizing your information, that communication that you spend um, with the other stakeholders also becomes a lot more effective. And not only communication, but also your cost estimation and scheduling. Um, this was um, from the poll. We've seen um, that the cost estimation and the um, tracking of takeoffs, that was one of the things that was highlighted as the most severe. And, um, you know, it's not something that we're very good at, right? So uh, typically our estimations are just a thumbs up or it's just the estimation from the previous project, um, but actually going back and tracking, you know, what is the what is the actual quantity takeoff? How does it compare to what we've estimated? That is something that is not um, done um, uh, quite a lot, but with the BIM-enabled process and with your information rich model, that certainly is um, a lot easier to do. It just actually requires the effort to do that, and that will inform um, your decisions for your next project and your next project, and then um, just improving on that. Um, and then, of course, um, increasing productivity is something, um, although there is like a learning curve, of course, um, the adoption we've talked about a little bit, uh, but you have to sort of keep your eye on the prize or the end goal is to always increase your product productivity as long as you are smart and as long as you are intentional. Um, there are multiple, multiple ways that that can be done. And then not forgetting that these processes go beyond the construction. Um, this also helps uh, to improve things like ma maintenance and other operational tasks of, um, of the building or the structure um, at the end of the project. Um, because this information is there, it can be used in, in, in a, lot of, a lot of ways even after construction. And then all in all, all of these things together really help with better risk management. Um, we know the, the things that come back to bite us at the end of a project. And really what you want to do is make sure that on your next project, um, those same things don't bite you as hard. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Kishia. Um, she's going to give us a legal perspective of everything that we've talked about. This is definitely one of the questions we were hear a lot. Um, uh, from our clients. So, Kisha, over to you um, for your perspective. Thanks, Naran, and a very good afternoon to all of you. So, as I've already been introduced, I'm not going to repeat any of my personal credentials. Um, instead, I'd like to use my allocated time for um, to briefly tell you a bit about our firm and our involvement in this webinar series with Baker Baines. So, to begin, um, our Anderson firm is an international tax advisory and full service law firm. Of course, I'm sure everyone participating here today is familiar with tax firms and law firms. So I doubt it will be helpful for me to spend time listing our various service offerings, which of course are available on our website. But what I would like to touch on are two aspects of Anderson, um, which I believe are quite unique to our firm. The first is our geographical presence. So we are currently the number one firm in the world from a geographical perspective. We are present in 170 countries globally, and in Africa alone, we are in 47 countries. Our presence globally was a strategic decision that was taken by our CEO, Mark Forzat, because we knew that in order to offer a one-stop service to our clients, we needed to be everywhere. The second unique aspect of our firm is our active participation in connecting businesses all around the world. We've got various projects that we roll out to get businesses talking to each other. And one which is very close to my heart is the Bridge Africa Europe project. So the purpose of this project is to actually connect businesses in various industries on the two continents. And of course, with a strong focus on bringing investment into Africa. It's so important for us that we add value to our clients. And the number one way that we believe that we are able to do this is by getting our clients actually talking to each other with the view of identifying like synergies and opportunities. And it's actually with this background that we've been given the privilege of collaborating with Baker Baines in this webinar series. Um, as has been explained to you 
um, by a few of the presenters already. This is a six part series. So it's, it's not my intention in this series to deal with any of the legal aspects. These are still coming. Um, and I urge you to keep a lookout for these if any of these topics are going to be of interest to you. Um, of course, it's not possible for us to address every single legal aspect that people like yourselves need to navigate through when managing risk or utilizing them. But we do intend touching on certain legal aspects that we think will be helpful to you. And these are going to include discussions on force majeure, on privacy policies, and of course, a big one, which is the protection of intellectual property. So while we do intend giving you a general overview, um, which we are sure you will, be, you will benefit from, we would like to ask that you submit any specific questions that you may have so that we can consider these and address them as part of the content in the webinar series. So after this webinar, you're going to be sent a form, which you can then please complete. And this will include a section for you to list any legal questions that you would like us to consider. So that's going to be very helpful. And of course, it'll add a bit more value to you because then you are having some questions answered that maybe are a little bit uncertain for you. Um, so that's all there is for me today, but I certainly look forward to spending more time with you and engaging with you as we continue with this webinar series. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kesh. Uh, that was insightful and we are super excited to hear more from you in the upcoming webinar. I just want to check that we are okay technically. Just checking with my colleagues. All right. So this is the stage where we stop talking and we actually want to hear from you. And as Kesha uh, alluded to, is uh, we would love to hear your suggestions on what you would like to see in this upcoming series. We really want to make sure that the content that we are delivering to you is pertinent to your context, the challenges that you're facing within a project risk management uh, space. So for those of you who are tech savvy, uh, you are welcome to QR code um, and link directly to a online form uh, where you can complete a, a very quick survey for us if you don't mind. Um, and in the, um, in the in the chat box, we also have a link for those of you who are not so tech savvy and prefer a direct direct link to our online form. Uh, there is an incentive, so um, if you complete the survey for us after this web webinar, we will be doing a lucky draw, um, and the winner will receive a CAD Learning uh, single user license. Um, and essentially, what this is going to afford you is access to over 40 of the Autodesk platforms, um, access to Autodesk accredited and certified content to help you within a project context so you can learn while on the project, um, offering micro tutorials that are between four and eight minutes long um, from software including AutoCAD, Revit, uh, BIM 360 or Autodesk Construction Cloud and we've even got a scan to BIM workflow so this is a, a massive value add. Um, the value of this is 2,650 Rand and one of you will be a lucky winner. So please make sure that you just take five minutes, or well, it's not even going to take five minutes, it'll probably take a minute and a half just to complete that form for us so that we can hear your voice and make sure that we are aligning our content to your specific needs. I'm just going to give a couple of seconds more for you to complete the survey and then we will close out with the Q&A. All right, for those of you um, who would like to also open up the discussion live, um, please feel free to share your questions in the chat box and we will be taking those questions shortly. 
All right, so by now you should have got through the survey. It's not a long one. There's a couple of multiple choices. Super, we look forward to hearing from you and please look out on our social media and um, the email that will go out uh, early next week. We will be announcing the lucky winner of the CAD Learning License. Great, so the first question that has uh, come up in our chat box um, is uh, what is next? So I'm going to hand over to Naran. Um, Naran, if you can maybe uh, share with our audience what is next in our BIM and technology impact on project risk management series. Let me quickly change over. Uh, I don't need to change over. Yeah, so what's next is um, we have four more parts of the series. Um, and the next one, we're actually going to be focusing on the scan to BIM portion of the workflow. Um, so much like you've seen from, from myself and Anin, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of break it down, but we'll also get into some of the, um, some of the nitty gritties of the workflow um, in terms of the different types of scanners, the different types of um, software that you can use to process the scan, and then also some tips and tricks here in the, um, on the actual process and making it um, a successful one when you actually use it on one of your projects. Fantastic, thank you so much, Naran. So as you can hear, uh, the series really is catered for all levels within the organization from users right through to decision makers um, because risk is really spread across the organization. So please make sure that you tune into the, the, the next series. Are there any other questions uh, before we close out? Anything else that anybody would like? Okay, so. How do you get in contact with Anderson? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, we will be sharing uh, information after this uh, webinar. So please look out for our emailer. Um, but we, uh, Kesha, would you like to, in the uh, chat section, maybe just share your email address? Um, and then you are welcome to get in contact with Kesha. She is... Um, a director at Anderson, and uh, if she is not able to deal with your query directly, she will pass it on to the correct colleague. I'll quickly just type it here in the chat box. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, it looks like there aren't any more questions. I just want to check that I get the correct email for Kesha. Um, uh, okay. Ma'am, I have put it in the chat. I'm not oh, sure if it's uh, if it's showing up. Sorry, just check. I may be technologically challenged, which is quite hilarious. <laughs> I can see it, it Kesha. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Kesha. It's come through. Wonderful. Okay, so if you would like to reach out to Kesha in the meantime, please feel free to do so on this email address. And then um, if there aren't any other questions, let me just double check. I think we have covered all of them. Thank you very much. All right, super. So in closing, how can we help you? So if you need help to measure BIM maturity and formulate your BIM vision, then, uh, or you want to, sorry, let me just switch my camera on, um, or you want to document and optimize your processes, um, Baker Bain certainly can assist you. Um, or if you're not sure where to start with a common data environment, and a common data environment is not Dropbox, <laughs> um, or, or you need help with your uh, standards implementation, 
or you perhaps need to upskill staff and add new BIM competencies. As we heard from Henning, this is definitely a, a, a hot topic within industry. Um, we absolutely can assist you with that. So um, Baker Baines really prides ourselves uh, by immersing ourselves within your project context, within your organization, um, really uh, getting to understand the pain points and to, to work with you and your team uh, to find a feasible solution. So uh, please go and uh, connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. They are our handles. Um, and if you would like to set up a uh, connect on Teams or a face-to-face -face meeting, please contact us on these uh, details below. Um, we also offer support um, from 8 until 10 o'clock, Monday to Friday for our clients. So uh, if you are needing that level of support please don't hesitate to connect with us okay ladies and gentlemen thank you so much for joining us for our kickoff for our um, first part one of the impact of women technology on project risk management uh, look out for when our next webinar uh, will be and uh, follow this series we are very excited um, how the conversation is going to progress have a great day and thanks for joining us